Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Confluent and Xperia webinar for supply chain and streaming machine learning and visualization. We've got an action-packed session today. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, if you have questions, please uh, enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom. Also at the end, we'll save some time for questions. Uh, and if you can enter your questions in that same box towards the end, and if you have a specific question from one of our speakers, you can enter their name and then what question you might have. With that, I'll hand it over to Brian Thompson. Hi, everybody. Uh, we have uh, a few folks today. We're going to do um, a little bit of a, a roundtable. Uh, I'm going to kick us off. Uh, I'm with the, um, the Xperia team, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we're running into. Uh, in the uh, supply chain space. And then um, we'll talk with uh, the remainder of the folks um, for uh, about 15 minutes each uh, to give us some insights into where they've applied uh, various technologies against these challenges. Uh, and um, if we move on to the next slide, we'll see um, that we'll talk about the challenges. We'll do a little bit of a demonstration of some of the visualizations that we've applied to these challenges. Uh, and then we'll talk about the application of Confluent and some of the event streaming capabilities they have. And then we'll talk a little bit more about some of the um, data science that we've used um, in pulling these solutions together. So with that said, um, I'll uh, start off uh, with some of the challenges that we've run into. Uh, there are kind of three um, main challenges that we've seen that have evolved in the supply chain space. And um, uh, this is really a, a long time um, in the making. And there are obviously some specific things today that we're all aware of with, with COVID-19, um, which definitely impacts each of them. Um, but there, uh, there are larger trends that I think really exacerbate the COVID-19 situation. And the first one uh, is really, um, uh, you know, it has to do with uh, with lean manufacturing uh, in a big way. But, you know, over the last 50 years, we've looked at uh, bringing production timeframes down. Uh, so we're producing things faster. And at the same time, we've actually also reduced uh, inventory levels. So we're trying to get a much more uh, efficient process uh, within production. Uh, the second item, uh, and uh, it's certainly all of these interact with one another, uh, and, and this is this is very much a consequence of, of that first uh, lean manufacturing process change um, is that when there is a disruption, those disruptions have as big an impact as they ever have. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, how that impacts the planning process and, and why that's happening uh, as we go through this. And then the third item uh, is in the way that we go about optimizing this process and that the, the planning and the optimization models that, that we've used and we've put in place um, are uh, especially challenging now and, and, and in a lot of cases just not working as well as they had been uh, as a result of, uh, of disruption and, and you know, specifically right now in the time of COVID-19. So as we move forward here, um, let's talk a little bit about the, the notion that the, the timeframes are shorter. So, you know, one of the major developments is, is in just-in-time production and lean manufacturing um, as a follow-up to that. Uh, you know, it was, it was developed in the 60s and 70s. So, you know, not, um, not it's, it's something that's, you know, not real recent, right? But it's, it's developed over, over the last 50 years. Uh, and its, its specific goal was to reduce the production um, and uh, supply response times. And so uh, this, this started in Japan, it started with Toyota, and then when the US auto uh, makers had to compete with the results of this process in Japan and ultimately the resulting Japanese car price decline, uh, they began to replicate that process uh, for themselves here in the US. Uh, and then uh, it, it moved on around the globe ultimately um, to basically all regions of the, of, of the world over the course of you know, the, the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, I, was, um, I was recently reading a, a Wall Street Journal article that, that pointed out that many of the companies that use the just-in-time methodology and the lean manufacturing methodologies 
uh, have actually left out some of the original tenants that were in the original designs for, for Toyota. And uh, those process designs actually called for having extensive backup plans to support interruptions um, or sudden demand surges. Uh, and, and the article actually suggested that a, a lot of the recent literature has just stripped out those facts um, and those parts of the process. And that's, you know, as we get um, to more of the lean uh, um, uh, deliver right off the production lines type of model, uh, we're trying specifically to keep those inventories down. And so basically this has resulted in systems that are lean, but also pretty brittle. Um, as you know, a result of trying to strip the inventory costs out of them. So wh while there are many factors, uh, one, many of these factors that have reduced the, the production time uh, and increased the, the responsiveness, uh, you know, two of the other things that I think are worth noting are, are the Walmart and the Amazon effects. And basically these have both been um, uh, used to drive production costs down further um, while still demanding a lot of product accessibility. So on top of everything else, the, the business are operating at lower margins and are much more sens sensitive than, than ever before to supply shocks. As we move forward to um, talk about the, the challenges of, of rapid change, um, you know, COVID-19, we're all thinking about it as a black swan event. Um, it, it's certainly a unique event in, in everyone's lifetime, I think is, is present for this conversation. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's not, it, 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 from one perspective, the, the impacts are going to be felt um, for a year, two years, three years, depending on the industry to come. Um, but it's not a standalone event. You know, we have disruptions, regional disruptions, weather, political um, changes to tariffs and, and, and immigration changes that impact uh, our supply chains um, on, a regular uh, on a regular basis. So th the reality is that our planning um, has to deal with this every day uh, in one form or fashion, in one industry or another. Um, as, as materials are, are late um, or, or unexpected orders arrive, resources are unavailable and they need to make decisions quickly uh, and, and figure out how to adjust uh, their plans. Uh, the, the third item I mentioned was about the, the models that we've been using. Um, and you know, the, the, the just-in-time process relies on some, some, some um, set constraints that we use. So we've established inventory policies, safety stock levels, lead times, transit modes, transit times. We've in general established, uh, depending on our particular manufacturing process, some pretty specific uh, uh, constants that we use in these models. There are things that have reasonably small variants that we go ahead and use as constants in order to make a more efficient optimization process. But as um, containers are not readily available, as airline capacity is down, as border crossings you know, can require quarantine times, some of the basic constraints that we've very consistently used over the last five and 10 years are, 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 are just no longer constant. Uh, so the plans need to be much more agile than they have in the past. And then while we have those types of things going on, on, uh, on the supply and demand side, we still have models that are also shifting. So on the supply side, we have businesses and industries and countries that are, um, that are weighing different strategic interests. And that's driving sourcing to move from the historic low cost global regions to domestic and near shore locations. And then on the demand side, we have economic downturn, continued you know, spread of the virus, which is driving demand planning to be more regionalized and, and more market focused. So, so that brings us to a, a bit of a summary here of, um, of these challenges. In, in our view, you know, one of the critical, um, one of the things I think we hear the most is about visibility. Uh, you know, the, the data is, is slow to get to the places it's need. We, we consistently see uh, numbers like 65 and 70% of uh, the supply chain leaders and you know, basically the planners 
they don't have access to the data they need when they need it. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, contained in a variety of different systems. It has to be pulled together. And so doing that in a timely fashion to make real-time decisions is always a challenge for basically everyone that we talk to. Um, once we have that data compiled and we've brought it together, it's difficult to, to find the issues, pinpoint them, and then to trace uh, backward to determine what the causes were or forward to figure out what the impacts of these uh, issues are. And so the traceability is, is definitely difficult. And then from, from a modeling standpoint, you know, the, the traditional optimization tools, they take a long time to run and they run on an entire system. And so uh, being able to act quickly and run what if scenarios in a localized way is, is not been a strong point and it's something that um, would really benefit us in, in, in trying to be um, more proactive and, and, and to even be reactive more quickly. So the net effect of these is a couple of things. Um, well, it's actually a whole number of things, but, but some of the things we hear the most are orders are missed, right? Like which most routinely results in lost revenue or at least forwarded revenue. But in a lot of cases, it res results in lost revenue. Um, it, it results in us having to spend more money expediting things. Um, so expediting fees are as high as they've ever been right now. Um, and then, you know, in the cases where we have SLAs, we have contract penalties and, and, you know, anywhere where we have some sort of misunderstanding about when something's going to be available, we have frustrated customers. So see, these are some of the, some of the biggest issues that, that folks are facing. So what do we need? Well, agility is the main thing. Um, we need to be able to see issues now and we need to be able to react to them uh, very quickly. Uh, and so uh, the biggest, uh, I think, um, the single biggest uh, um, uh, impact, right? The, the, the single biggest opportunity that we have is, is really to increase our agility to be able to respond to these. So I'm gonna give two quick use cases to try to, to clear this up um, and to uh, drive some of the rest of the conversation. Uh, and, um, and, and to put this into perspective. Uh, and then what we'll do is move into uh, to some demonstration around the problem and, and some of the potential solutions. So in, in this case, uh, we were working with a, a major uh, shipbuilder and um, what the issue was, was really an issue of, of local optimization over system-based optimization and the cost associated with local optimization decisions uh, rather than things that were going to benefit the entire manufacturing process and the entire manufacturing system. So um, what would happen was we would overproduce certain materials, underproduce other materials, and in, in some cases just completely lose uh, components that we're working on. And one of the examples is that we would we walked into the machine shop and these guys were showing us their process. The machine shop had extra bandwidth, so they got done with some things um, on schedule and they actually had some extra bandwidth. So now they needed to make a decision of okay, what should I work on next? That's not exactly scheduled, and so they opted to produce a certain plate. They produced that plate, and when they were done with it, they realized that the next shop down the down the stream, the assembly shop, wasn't ready for it. But it's an enormous plate. So they, they literally just left it where it was because there was no other place to put it. The assembly shop wasn't ready to deal with it. Um, and a month later, when the assembly shop called and asked where it was, they literally had to go looking for it. They found it underneath another platform um, where several things were stacked on top of that platform. And they suspected that it had actually been damaged based on a small piece they could see of it. So in the end, they actually ended up having to start it over. Uh, and so now a process that was potentially a month ahead of schedule was actually behind schedule because they had to go back and do that. So making this local optimization um, had a negative effect over it. And, and the reason is they couldn't see what they, they couldn't see all the things that they should base their decision on, on what to do, right? They couldn't see and look ahead in the schedule of other shops. And so they made it, they made the best choice they could and it ended up having an overall negative effect on the, on the system. The, the next use case is uh, in an, an auto parts um, uh, and, and specifically 
uh, a, um, uh, a plastics molding manufacturer, if we move on to the next slide, what we'll see is that um, you know, one of their challenges actually revolved around transportation bins. So th the bins were used for a, a number of different reasons, but, but one of the common reasons, or one of the common cases was to move the materials from the actual uh, molding presses over to uh, the painting lines. And so what would happen is the folks on the painting line would be ready to run the next job. They'd go look for the bin, but they couldn't find the bin with the scheduled parts in it. And now they, they'd search around a little bit, but they couldn't find it. And now they had no insight into when that bin would get there. They could look back and see the bin left the previous location, but now there's no ability to trace it in between one location to the next. And it wasn't always just move it five feet away, right? It moves around the shop. Sometimes it was done, you know, two or three days earlier. Um, and so there was no way to figure out where it was or what they should do. And now they're stuck saying, okay, should I start my next job, which maybe requires a little bit of retooling, um, or should I wait until this arrives? And, and, and so there were delays as a result of this in the entire production process and ultimately the finished goods. Uh, so the solution here was to add IoT devices to the bins and then be able to access the real-time bin location data as it moved around the facility, uh, which helped with the overall efficiency of the, of the production process. So with, with that, I'll turn it over to Chris, um, who's gonna uh, walk us through some solutions. Go ahead, Chris. Thanks, Brian. Um, so I think uh, I'll just echo what Brian said. We're we're dealing with a lot of a, a lot of um, highly connected sets of processes. Uh, these processes are um, are dependent on a lot of late, highly latent, siloed um, data sitting in in, um, in in systems that are you know sometimes really old and and often unconnected. So gaining that visibility over, over um, the entire uh, manufacturing pipeline is hard. And then once you have that data, seeing it in a meaningful way um, and being able to anticipate issues, check the feasibility of plans, and then run mitigation when there are, when there are um, changes and, and disruptions is really, really hard to do with, with the, the ecosystem that's in place from a systemic standpoint. So, I'm going to go through a few of um, uh, of examples that we've we've used our tool set to be able to um, alleviate some of this disjointed data and look at it holistically, and then be able to um, be able to actually run mitigation plans on it within a manufacturing process. Um, and the slide we're looking at here is showing um, how interconnected these things are, not just from a data standpoint, but from even uh, how things roll up to business value and what the use cases um, are on the right-hand side uh, and how they're interconnected and actually um, they, they influence a lot of the, 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 um, the, the business value that we're trying to capture, um, but they're not discrete. So you know, if, you have, if you have issues, for example, in capacity planning, it's going to hit the bottom line across a lot of different strategic objectives, and that's going to that that's that's ultimately going to um, have have uh, financial ramifications. Um, the you know the use cases that we're going to look at um, are um, are are business cases uh, specifically, but we're going to talk about solutions that um, have to do with data analytics, data visualization, and, and, and optimization to some degree. And for that, we're gonna talk about stitching together a lot of this connected data. That's where I think Kai can speak um, um, with, with some specifics around what Confluent can offer. And, and this analysis ultimately um, comes together in a machine learning that, that Graham will cover. Um, we're gonna look at different pieces of connected data. So we're gonna look at a bill of materials um, as well as um, manufacturing pipelines. And then ultimately there are logistics here. So those are the types of data visualizations we're gonna see. And we're gonna see this across different constituents. So um, we're gonna look at, uh, for example, planners looking at the feasibility of their, of their manufacturing plan. Um, we're gonna look at product owners and people that are looking 
um, at higher level aggregation of, of data to see if they're, if they're going to um, actually make their production schedules across a product line. And then we'll boil that up all the way to uh, interdisciplinary um, parts of the organization. So when, when people are doing strategic um, planning around, around, uh, around um, sales and operation planning on a quarterly basis, for example. So with that, I'll jump into um, a few of the solutions. The first thing I'm going to show is um, a set of dashboards that show aggregations across high level measurements. So we're looking at demand sensing here. Um, we're looking at, at revenue across product lines, um, how that impacts sales, what the aggregated risk is across all those product lines, and then some utilization. So high level measurements, but distribute distributed across a lot of systems. And so just to get influence um, bubbled up here to the point where we can, we can actually make a decision means that we have to stitch together a lot of disparate systems. Um, once we get this, we always show this over the course of time. So in this case, we're looking forward in a planning organization um, view. So here I would be, I, I would, I, you know, this would be the, the high level, um, set of strategic planning um, meetings maybe would look at, uh, at this, set of, th this set of figures. And what I wanna see is how this is influenced over time. I also wanna bring other data in so I can actually say what, see what the risk matrix is. So I'd be bringing in information from inventory and utilization. So I'm looking at resourcing here. I'm looking at supplier compliance and maybe even um, things that are a little bit less intangible and have to mainly uh, be inferred maybe through machine learning, uh, such as supplier confidence and maybe regional uh, disruptions that are, that are influencing what my demand sensing is, for example, or what my bottom line sales uh, loss per location is going to be. And I can attenuate this, so I may want to um, take out utilization altogether and, and up um, the threshold on how I'm going to measure in uh, inventory shortage. So that's going to reset the way that the risk is, is shown on some of these high level dashboards. Um, I can see other things across this time horizon. So if I want to look at how demand relates to production, for example, this is where I start to bring in uh, information that I might be pulling from IoT or inventory systems, where I'm seeing what the actual is uh, measured up against the demand. So um, this is good to, to counterbalance. And I can look at this uh, through multiple lenses. So I can look at high level measures that, such as, as these on this card, or I can look at something uh, more through forecasting and we can start to offer recommendations. So this gets into now that we've actually gained visibility, now we can start to bring in what the risk um, profile looks like and what the, what the mitigation strategies might be. Um, and this can be done with, um, you know, machine learning as well as other, other types of algorithms to be able to pinpoint some of that stuff. From a visual standpoint, we just want to bubble that up to what those forecasts look like um, at a very high level. Uh, we can get into uh, even more detailed views. So we can look at this from a strict, strictly a demand setting for uh, supply. Um, or even an operational standpoint, what it looks like per location, for example. Um, do I have bottlenecks in my utilization? Do I have peaks in my utilization where my demand uh, may not be able to um, uh, uh, measure up to that? Um, so once the, the, the bottom line here is once those systems are stitched together and we're looking at the, 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 the full cosmology of, of the data, we can start to see high level information. If we wanna go a rung down and we wanna to start to look at specific product lines, we can even get into um, a specific product, for example, and look at, um, in this case, we're looking at a representation of the, the major assemblies of a given product. And so um, at the top here, we've got the finished good, and these are all the low level assemblies. They are combined to make um, you know, larger assemblies all the way up to the point where the product is ready to ship. So this is a good representation of what might be considered a bill of materials. And the color here is our risk profile that I, that I covered earlier on, 
But what this is showing in this case is shortages or bottlenecks around coverage of inventory for that part. So if I see this over a time horizon, I can actually see where my demand is and how that changes from the standpoint of just a single product and its constituent parts. So, you know, within this period, if I'm trying to check the feasibility of a plan, I'm, I'm gonna have a lot of shortages within that profile. And I can drill in and see what the profiles look like for any of these specific parts. This allows me to be able to, 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 be able to, to set mitigation strategies to swap out that or smooth out some of the, um, some of the, some of the demand issues I might have. Um, if I want to then take this set of views in this dashboard and do something slightly more transactional and start to plan a scenario that I might be able to mitigate some of these issues, we can take a look and see what that looks like. Um, so it's a very similar view that we were just looking at. I've got a set of products here um, and then I've got their demand versus production profiles and then some of the financials around that. So now I'm really looking at the feasibility of the plan and how it hits the bottom line for a given product. And I can attenuate some of this information. So um, I can basically set different um, thresholds to be able to see what my, what my flow health is for the material for that. And what I'm basically doing is I'm looking for um, discrepancies between um, demand and production. And again, I'm looking across the entire uh, sets, the constellations, if you will, of, of all the different systems brought together in a unified model. Um, and as Brian said before, the more real time that information, the better, because, um, be, because uh, you know, the frequency of disruption is increasing and the, the, uh, the time, the cycle time and the expected delivery to the market is shrinking all, all the time in, in modern manufacturing. But if I see discrepancies here, now I can start to click in and now I can get a better view of my flow health. So what we're looking at here is for, for a specific product, I'm looking at the manufacturing process. Um, in this case, it's a, it's a chemical process. So we're looking at the, the, the supplier side of, the, of, of garnering the active, active ingredients that moves to a formulation stage, it's packaged and then shipped to distribution. Um, the lines that are connecting these things are the flow of material. The boxes themselves are the actual locations, the factories or the distribution centers. And so what the lines are showing me are number one, the thickness is the volume of material. And then the color is the health of the flow of that material. If I'm looking in a forward planning setting, this is basically the feasibility of my plan. Am I going to have bottlenecks? Do I have a large amount of material coming from a supplier that um, is, is at risk of, of some kind of ske schedule slippage. And again, I can see how that manifests itself over time. Um, I can also just allocate um, a set of filters to show what, um, what the real danger points are. So basically filter that down to just the low and medium low flow health. Um, I can also filter this through a set of bill materials. So um, if I want to basically select a subset of the materials, now this is the full product. I'm just looking at a sub-assembly here and I notice that there's a bottleneck issue here. So um, I can even see what the runs are for those given, for those given materials. And uh, one is even expedited and we've got an issue here. So at this point I can run a mitigation strategy um, I'm going to rebalance basically the resources here. I believe it's a resource issue. So um, this brings me to another set of workflows, which I'm looking now at the schedule of resources across um, a time horizon here. And I can see uh, things in the past as well as things in the future. So I can see how the actuals are measuring up. And what I'm looking at is the, um, the, the amount of utilization for a set of resources. So I can see um, if things are red, it means that uh, for that given month, my set of resources, mechanical resources in this case, so factory lines are, um, are, are overbooked. 
If they're yellow, they're underbooked. And what I wanna do is get them in this Goldilocks zone. So I immediately see I've, I've, I've had issues and in the future I'm going to have capacity utilization issues. I can, I can go up to the KPIs and they can kind of tell me at an aggregate level what's going on there. Um, I can go resource by resource and see what that profile looks like for this given factory. Um, but the, 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 the real thing I wanna do is basically balance um, this and the system now that it has the data can help me do that. Um, so what I'm basically going to do is allow the system to help me rebalance the schedule. So I'm gonna analyze it. It's gonna come back with some recommendations for each of the resources that it found um, abil uh, abilities to balance out. It has it here. I can take these resources and it says, move this material in September from this amount to this amount. And what I'm basically doing is trying to um, smooth out the, the, the jagged uh, aspects of, of that capacity flow. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna select all of these and then I'm going to apply them. And what that will basically do is give me a readout of, of, um, of what has changed in my plan. And so it ha it's given me a good start. It's, it started to balance out material. I can look and see what that looks like compared to my baseline. And sure enough, it has moved things in my baseline here. I can just see what, my, what the changes were. Um, here, it, it's red in the baseline for, for, for this month. And it's, it's, it was able to smooth it out just by moving around material and utilizing different uh, resources and in, in, in suggesting different flows. So to tie that back to, um, to, uh, to what Brian was, was mentioning, um, we've now connected the data, we've gained visibility over it, and we, we've started to allow the system to work for us to, to basically use, use that information to optimize signals that we're getting in real time from that connected data through a set of recommendations. So uh, in the interest of time, I will, uh, I'll stop there and I'll kick it back to you, Scott. All right, next speaker up is Kai, uh, who's gonna share with us now sort of how these two items uh, create sort of the streaming capability that is uh, quite powerful. Okay, thanks a lot. And I think this is really a good connection to the other sections before, because we've heard a lot about the challenges of supply chain and how they are changing. And then also that the visibility into these chains is really important to understand the problems and then to optimize them. And that's often where an event streaming platform with Kafka and Confluent comes into play. I don't want to give a deep dive here into Kafka, but on a high level, really, it's a, a streaming platform, which means on the one side, it can process data in real time for high volumes. So really millions of events per second. But on the other side, it also has two more core capabilities, which is data integration. Because as we heard before, you need to integrate too many data sources to get all this data. And then you can process the data. That's the other part of Kafka. And you can do that continuously, either in real time, because all of this is even based in Kafka. Or on the other side, of course, you can build visualizations on top of that, like you have seen in the last section in a live demo. And this combination makes this so powerful. The heart of it is real time and scalable, but also you can ingest it into other layers where you build, for example, on a materialized view to do analytics and visualization. And with this in mind, on the next slide, I want to show you a first demo or use case. Like in this broad presentation, I mainly focus on use cases and examples. And I always also share the links that you can go deeper into these use cases. And I also use uh, supply chain examples from different industries. And the first one is about a food value chain. This is Bader, a food company based in Germany, but having um, production plants across the globe. And they are using Apache Kafka for exactly what we have discussed before, to build a complete single source of truth for their full supply chain. And this means they have data integration needs for many different systems. This is internal interfaces, sensors, machines, applications, but also external information like GPS information or weather information for their logistics and routing plans. 
And this is really about their business critical operations. And therefore, this is a combination on the one side of real-time processing of the data to correlate the center information for logistics and for the machines, but then also ingest the data into other databases for doing um, visualizations on top of that to analyze historical data. And this is really the, the win-win situation of how you combine this in this example at Bader. On the next slide, I want to go a little bit deeper into this with another example. This is Porsche and Porsche on their blog and on website explain how they use Apache Kafka. And in the end for them, it's the event backbone, which means like you have seen before, Kafka is the heart of the infrastructure being an asynchronous streaming platform. This means different producers and consumers use the data. Some are real time, some are near real time, some are batch. And that's totally fine, but the heart of it is this event-based real-time data. And as you can see here in this statement from um, one of the platform managers from Porsche for their data streaming platform, Porsche is using that through their role supply chain. So this is really important. So this includes different business units like sales and manufacturing and connected vehicles. All of the data is relevant and typically not just for one business unit, but for different ones. And this is where Kafka comes into play. Someone produces data like a machine from a sensor, a sensor from a machine. And then for example, even it's important for sales and for many other um, business units. And that's where Kafka is heavily used at Porsche to build a decoupled infrastructure. All of these business units build their own applications, but then this is all still integrated and correlated with each other. And on the next slide, I want to go a little bit deeper into the product perspective, because what I've shown you with Bader and Porsche is to use cases more or less from an end, end user, which produces and sells good in the supply chain. And as part of that, of course, you have a lot of software products, which can be standard software or can be a cloud service, or it can be custom applications you build by yourself. And a clear trend we see here on the market is that these products or infrastructures are getting more and more open and flexible because that's the requirement. And again, that maps perfectly to what we have heard in the first section about the challenges, how our supply chain is changing these days. You need to be able to change your supply chain. And, and this means all the different components you have, including your um, standard software, your cloud services, and your custom applications. And not surprisingly, a lot of these ecosystems use Kafka for their next generation systems. Because again, they are real time, they are scalable, but also mission critical workloads. And still you can also integrate with other systems like in the bottom, in the top left, you see a legacy system. This uses maybe an XML message interface and it's file-based, that's totally okay. But still you need to integrate these legacy systems with, um, with the modern technologies, maybe something on the bottom where it's its own SRM system um, for supplier relationship management, um, which is built also on Kafka. And so we see a lot of these systems combined with each other some are more like a legacy approach, some others using modern technologies. And here Kafka is often the heart of that because it's um, again, real time and scalable at the same time. And that's important for the foundation to build such a open and flexible sublet chain. On the next slide, you will see that it's even more than that. It's not just about your own software and infrastructure. More and more of our customers also need to modernize their supply chain regarding the integration with partners. Because think about that, like in this picture, like in the middle, you have your ERP system, which is based on Kafka, and it integrates with an MES system on your right side. So all of that is part of the supply chain. And even if it's within the same company, um, if, if both of these systems are real time and scalable based on Kafka, um, then of course the interface also needs to be some scalable real time system. It, it doesn't work well if you have just a web service in the middle here or another batch platform. And then on the left side, you'll see here that even with suppliers, like in this case of an OEM, the tier one supplier, they often use Kafka by themselves already. Um, maybe like in this example, in the Confluent Cloud in a serverless way for the product. But then for the integration back to the OEM, they also use Kafka then because it doesn't make sense to have a web service between two streaming services. It doesn't scale well and it's not real time. And this is really important to understand that 
um, it's really not just about the company itself, but also about integrating with the partners in the supply chain. And that's also getting more and more into the streaming way because it has to be real time and highly scalable. And on the next slide, you see a great example for that. So this is Walmart. And I mean, probably even if you're not in the US, you know what Walmart is. So it's one of the biggest retailers on the planet. On the top left, you see a few numbers of what they are doing. But what's more interesting for this talk is not their size, but how they have built their real-time inventory system, which is one of the key pieces of their supply chain management. And not just internally, but again, also to their partners. But even internally, I mean, Walmart, that's a lot of different distribution centers and it's a lot of stores where the customers go. You need to work with a lot of vendors. And as you can imagine, this is a lot of different systems. And on the bottom left, you see a few of them, like the warehousing and fulfillment center, the stores, and, and all of this is relevant for the inventory system. And therefore, Walmart has built this completely on Kafka to track the different information from the different systems. And here's the same. Some of them are standard software. Some other are more like a cloud service. And some others are built by themselves with their own custom code. Not all of them are real time, but many are or are getting real time or near real time. But some others are still a database, for example, to build visualization on top of that for understanding everything in your supply chain. And therefore, again, the heart of that is Kafka so that you can provide real time information to other systems. But it's still okay if some of the consumers are batch or are request response communication. So this is a pretty impressive example. And once again, like for the other examples, there's a lot more information in the Kafka Summit talk of them or in our blog with Walmart at the Confluent blog. So you can read a lot more about how they optimize their supply chain and inventory system. So let's now go to another topic on the next slide, which is also related to, to everything we've seen before in this session today. So with supply chain, we typically see more and more machine learning applied. And uh, that's not just alone, but often with Kafka again. So here, or also on the next slide, you see that um, it's really the whole ecosystem which is often used here. Because as you need to integrate with so many different systems and databases, both from the source side and also with the sync side, you need to use not just Kafka for the high volume and real-time data integration, but you can also use Kafka Connect for using the connectors to like an Oracle database or an MQTT sensor or a SaaS application like Salesforce. So that's all built into Kafka. And the same is true for data processing. When you want to aggregate and correlate and transform the data or build your own applications where you apply analytic models, that's what you can do with Kafka because then you have it highly available and real time. The same is true for machine learning. So that's not anything different. And therefore, on the next slide, I also want to show you one example for that. Here you see BMW. BMW is also a heavy Kafka user. And not just that, of course, they also have a lot of machine learning infrastructure. Here's just one of the examples I want to cover here because it's a good fit for the supply chain use cases. Um, BMW is using Apache Kafka together with different machine learning frameworks for their digital contract intelligence. So um, they're using natural language processing and so that they can automate many of the contracts for their um, buying processes, working together with partners and customers. And they're using Kafka here as an orchestration layer. From the beginning, BMW knew that they don't use just one machine learning framework and some are Python, some are Java, some others are cloud services from Azure or AWS. So they have built an architecture so that they can consume events from different systems and use different machine learning frameworks on top of that. So again, it leverages all the features of Kafka like they described, as you can see on the right side. Um, Kafka is not just fast and scalable, but it's also flexible because it decouples all these different systems and technologies from each other. And this is why Kafka is used so heavily in different machine learning infrastructures. I also want to point out that Kafka is not machine learning. It's really complementary to use machine learning frameworks together with Kafka, um, both for the model training, but also then even more for the model deployment and real-time monitoring part. And on the next slide related to that, in general, we see more and more trends that in many of these supply chains, the, the business is changing because companies are going away from just selling the hardware and machinery 
but more and more are going to sell more software and services. A keyword here is the digital twin, which is the buzzword for that. But no matter how you call it, companies like car makers are not just selling cars anymore. They are selling the software in the cars and that's where the best margins are. A famous example here is Rolls Royce. So they already have this kind of um, power by the hour concept for many, many, many years. And now all the other manufacturers and in any industry are going this way too, because they want to go like the, the Silicon Valley companies. They want to do more with software because that's where the revenue and the margins are. And on the next slide, we see one specific example for this. This is Audi, which started building a connected car infrastructure with Confluent many years ago already so that they can really get the data out of the driving cars on the streets in real time for doing analytics and building a lot of different use cases on top of that. And actually one of the first use cases was after sales. And this is pretty impressive, I think, because this shows how even for traditional car makers, the supply chain is completely changing or getting more enhanced and advanced. So you don't want to just produce cars and sell them and maybe go to the repo shop again. With over-the-air updates, you can buy new features. And then also um, you can integrate um, with the CRM system to know exactly what your customer is doing and what he might buy in the future. Or maybe even integrate with partners like restaurants, for example. And many other examples exist for connected car infrastructures, not just for Audi, but in general in the market. And why real-time streaming is so important for that. On the next slide, I have the last example. Um, so this is also an, a very interesting IoT example. This is Bosch, a tier one supplier for many car makers and other companies. And they actually have also built something what is really relevant for the whole supply chain of their products. Because what they have built is a track and trace system where they can create this visibility of their supply chain in real time. And this is not just meant for the manufacturing, but really, in this case, when they have um, um, machines for their um, construction sites, then they really do track and trace in the construction areas. They know everything about all the machines and devices and also about the workers which have mobile apps in the construction area. And in this way, they can track the, the machines like, um, do you need to replace a battery or is something broken? But also simply just to find the devices in the construction area so that nothing gets lost. And then in the back end, the, the users in the offices can also track this information. And these users then use tools like we've seen in the live demo before for visibility, to know how each construction area is working and also to understand what can be optimized in the supply chain end to end. And this is therefore also a very interesting example where in this case, Confluent Cloud is used to have everything in a serverless way. So that Bosch in this case could build just the applications and analytics and did not have to worry about the infrastructure based on Kafka. And with that, um, on the next slide, I just want to summarize this. Um, in the end, this is in the end what we are doing at Confluent. Um, we are doing event streaming. We are doing it with Apache Kafka and its ecosystem. We were, uh, Confluent was founded by the creators of Kafka. They got venture capital and founded Confluent to make Kafka enterprise ready. And today over 80% 80 80 of the Fortune 100 companies trust and use Kafka. And actually I think in the meantime, it's even much, much more than that. And not just for the big companies, but also for the smaller ones. So Kafka is more or less used everywhere. And I today just wanted to show you a few of the use cases and how that really makes sense for supply chain. And on the next slide, you'll see in the end what we are doing with Confluent. Again, we're doing Kafka and nothing but Kafka. We're doing Kafka and building an ecosystem on top of that with different products for operations, for monitoring, and also for data integration, for example. And then we have on the one side, a fully managed cloud service for serverless and consumption-based pricing of Kafka and its ecosystem. And we have a self-managed solution which you can deploy in a data center or even much closer to the edge like in a factory or in a retail store. And that's what we do. And um, we are the product vendor for this ecosystem of event streaming and work together with partners like Xperio to build these projects at our customers. And therefore, with that, I want to hand over again um, to the Xperio team to talk a little bit more about um, what, what they can do together with event streaming with us um, for you to help you. Thanks, Kai. That was an awesome intro to the technology that services the use cases that, that Brian and Chris talked about earlier. 
I'm going to dive into one particular use case here so that we so that my section isn't very, very long. But I want to make sure that everyone recognizes this is one example of the use of this technology and the same system can be used the same infrastructure and the particular algorithm I'm going to talk about can be used in a variety of contexts inside of the supply chain planning space. One of the other contexts that we've talked about in previous webinar, which you can find on our website, is delivery and logistics using a system like this to do real-time routing of deliveries in a multinational supply chain. So please go have a look at that. We're going to be talking today about the actual rough cut planning optimization inside of a multinational supply chain network. What we want to accomplish here is to give supply chain planners a view of what could be done using the assets currently in play in the supply chain and give them a better visibility into how to redeploy those assets to optimize their runs, their production runs from the beginning to the end of that production life cycle. Chris showed this in his demo and I'm gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna focus on the UI here because he did an excellent job of showcasing that. Instead, I'm gonna jump into the back end and tell you about a methodology that we use to be able to solve this problem using machine learning. This is a cartoon diagram of the ways in which we integrate our systems to be able to solve that rough cut planning use case. As Kai showed on a previous slide, this system is fed continuously by real-time streams, and I'll get to that in a, in a subsequent slide. But before we get there, let me just kind of talk through how the system works. The two blue boxes on this slide operate fully independently, and they operate in real time all the time. The, box, the blue box on the left is a simulator of the actual business procedures, in this case, the actual supply chain plan that's being enacted. And the right blue box is a reinforcement learning training system, which operates continuously to make sure that the solutions offered in that UI are fully adaptive. So they change in real time based on the on the ground conditions that we see in that UI. As you can see here, uh, if you're familiar with this type of system, this is a classic so-called decentralized reinforcement learning system where we have these two components acting fully independently. So again, the beauty of this is that our models are getting better and better, adapting to the operational procedures on the ground in real time while we're offering up better and better recommendations to the users of the software you saw earlier. If you're interested in the detailed mathematical specifics and all that jazz, um, again, uh, dive into the blogs on our website. We have the description there. So let me show you how this system interacts with the rest of the ecosystem, the rest of the product ecosystem. This is really critically important because there are three different touch points for the Kafka stream to be able to make this system work and update in real time live. So the first one is we have to get the data in somehow, right? So we have to know uh, where the assets are located. We have to know what the production schedules look like currently. We need to know, um, you know, which equipment is in use and what the capacities are on those uh, pieces of equipment and processes. Um, and as Kai mentioned earlier, we can actually even go down to the level of labor resources as well to make sure that we don't overload particular teams. That's at the top of the diagram there. And that's fed in through Kafka streams, through, through uh, uh, Kafka events. And then the streams, you do your uh, processing on those uh, inputs, which go into the reinforcement learning model we looked at in the previous slide. And this actually, this system operates in conjunction with whatever system you have in place to do this work today. Um, I've just noted that as a business logic box, but of course, you know, we, we all know as uh, supply chain uh, professionals that these logic systems, these business rules are hugely complex. They're nested uh, and we'll, we can take the outputs and do recommend taking the outputs of the systems in place so that we can feed that simulation engine that we saw on the previous slide. So that it doesn't end there. What we have is a verification of the results as they come out of our um, recommendation engine there, that reinforcement learning model. 
And we have the system feed the UI in a way that not only asks the user to provide input back in real time, but also gives some explainability metrics about the use of the system, e.g. why the system is making the decisions it's making. I'll show an example of that momentarily. The but before I do, I just wanted to cover that sort of explainable AI uh, box you see there um, with some case examples on the next slide. What we see here is three different types of screens for three different types of users. These, the, the screen in the upper right is a fairly uh, data intense, hardcore screen for analysts and data scientists to use to understand where bias exists in our models. Like for instance, um, can we tell that um, machines in particular facilities all correspond to some drag on production schedule? The screen on the left is a, of course, this is just a, one of the actual screens we've output in, in other products before, but that's meant for planners who want to look inside of the actual signals and correlate, correlate those back to features as input into the model. Like for instance, in the planning space, we could have a feature of uh, capacity of machine, like real-time capacity of uh, a machine in a facility. And the final one on the bottom is an interactive display that users can actually interact with the model to be able to identify the mechanisms by which the model is providing correct or incorrect recommendations. And an example of that is shown on the next slide in the general case. This is how it works in all contexts where we have a decision being generated to the UI you saw earlier a user giving some feedback, like maybe this schedule was good or this schedule was bad. And then that system going back and updating itself again in real time, fully automated using that confluence system. A specific example if, is on the next slide here where I've just kind of noted um, some you know, possible uh, interactions you could have with the system. So for instance, the user could say, could actually give two different types of feedback. One is explanatory in its reasoning. Like for instance, this schedule ignores uh, the delivery or the, the, the production for a priority customer. But the other, which is much more common is, hey, that's a bad recommendation. Both of those types of feedback help our system update, retrain and redeploy in again, real time. What happens when we do this? So in the next slide, we're showing an improvement in accuracy over time. And we've done this through, if you click the button one more time there, Chris, uh, we've done this through simulation and real-time data aggregation. So before we go through the process of collecting thousands of points of um, supply chain planner feedback, we actually estimate what the accuracy increase will be on the system as we get those corrections over time. And then of course, you see that improvement as the system remains in use. That is all performed through the use of the Confluent system to make sure that this stuff is not only deployed, but also updated in real time. On the next slide, we're showing how that works. And you can click through the animation there again, Chris, and for the sake of time, we see that there is a sort of a, a bifurcated pipeline. And this is nothing new to folks who are experienced in the machine learning operations space. There is a fully independent training cycle and there is a fully independent inference cycle. That inference engine is the thing that feeds plan recommendations to the front end. And of course that data is being aggregated through Confluent in real time. That's how we get the data in. Hey, make another decision, make another decision. The training cycle there on the bottom is also operating in real time. As we showed on that system slide way above, we have this system learning both through new data ingestion and through human use ingestion, feedback ingestion from the UI and outputting at some cadence, which I'll discuss in the next slide, uh, back to the inference engine so that the results are updated in the UI. And that cadence on the final slide here is the um, use of these four systems, right? So as Kai mentioned earlier, we want to use real-time monitoring of our outputs into the UI to make sure that we're serving the business use case properly. 
again, that is very easily um, serviced using the Kafka system. To operationalize this stuff, we need machine learning CICD. Those tools are widely available now. Um, the active learning piece is the piece where we make those real-time updates. And we walked through the interpretability metrics earlier. So that is how this supply chain planning system is actually operationalized in practice using the Confluent tools. So thanks for joining us. We have some uh, references on the next slide for you to take a peek at. Uh, if you have any questions, please do contact, contact us and we look forward to uh, seeing you next time. Great, well, thanks guys. This was a power packed session, very exciting. We've got some questions coming in. We'll pause here for a moment and then uh, we'll go to the live Q&A. Um, we appreciate everybody joining today. Uh, we have a couple of questions here that we'll get through quickly. Um, the first one is, it looks like uh, we're currently using SAP and Confluent. Uh, and how, uh, how does this plug in with my system? And I'll throw this to you, Brian Thompson. Uh, sure. Um, uh, mo most of our customers actually are using SAP um, in some form or fashion, uh, whether it's uh, the ERP backend financials or even in more cases, the supply chain management suite, um, including some of the planning tools, um, in many cases, APO. Uh, and, and those still function as the, the master um, system of records for our customers. Uh, even the APO functionality and, and really what we're doing is sitting on top of that and adding to it. So uh, whether through Kafka or other measures, depending on the customer, we get feeds from those sources. Um, the integration is um, reasonably straightforward. Uh, in the cases where we want real-time data, we do that through the Kafka uh, uh, technologies. And in the cases where that's a little less important or maybe the data is not as easily available, we can pull it in through Excel and whatnot. But but, but all said, we, we actually sit on top of that and, and use that data um, for, for some of what we've shown you today. Okay, uh, second question, uh, and then we'll take a break here. It looks like it's for you, Graham, which is how much data do you need to train a system that's connected to Kafka like this? You don't need much data at all. Um, in fact, what we find is commonly that customers are worried about this. And all you need is enough data that shows us how the supply chain operates, like what your business operations look like, even if that data is minimal, we can start there and move forward. Okay. Um, and does it, uh, does it work in uh, Azure? Yep, the system can be deployed in Azure in any cloud environment or in, uh, also in a, in a mixed environment on-prem cloud, yep. Okay, fantastic. Well, given we're a few minutes over, uh, we don't have any other new questions in there. If you do have questions, certainly follow up with us uh, and excited to talk with everyone. And again, thanks for attendance today. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.